<laughs> Inside jokes. Hi everybody, I'm Scott. If you don't know me, uh, this is who I am. I'm married to beautiful Kitty Weaver. She's oh, she's down the back there. Got three awesome kids, two sweet ass grandkids, and uh, I love life. Like seriously, I feel so blessed constantly in my life to be able to hang out with different people, to spend time with friends, to think about friends, to pray for friends, to send friends messages. I am, yeah, the fullness of life is not missed with me. So what I'm going to try and do this morning is talk. If you've got, like, what's that thing where you don't sleep well? Insomnia. This is the morning for you. I am going to help you come to a rest, a peace with your eyelids. Before I start, I just want to really acknowledge Steve and Amy and just say thank you for who you guys are, for what you do, the way you lead and you gather and you bring people here, the way you welcome people and the way you inspire people. Uh, I don't think we say it enough and I just really honour you before us, the Fano that that gathers because of what you do, what you sacrifice. And yeah, I'm humbled, honestly, to be called one of your friends. It's such a cool, a cool buzz. And um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for what you do and who you are. <laughs> green heart. I don't understand that. It's a bit weird. Imagine if you cut into an animal and you've got a green heart instead of a red one. I'm not eating that one. Yeah. If it's a chocolate, well, yesterday we went to the, fir- the lolly shop that's on wherever, out by the dump, Dyer's Road. <laughs> it was the right shop. And they had these little wee white love hearts, you know, and they got silver wrappers, no, white wrappers on them. And it was 20 bucks for this tiny little bag. No, it was more than that, eh? It was 38 bucks. I was like, what is going on on this planet? If you have to spend that much money for white hearts, if you've got normal hearts, way cheaper. Like the red ones, cheap as. I don't see any green ones, but they're probably cheaper. Anyway, that will come back a bit later in the message. I'll ask some questions, yeah. And if you forget how much those hearts cost, you're out. Yeah, no soup. No soup for you. So I haven't got the scripture, Scott. He's out the back that does the overheads. But I'm going to read. This is Ephesians 4, 11 to 14. Don't look it up because I could be making this up. And you might think, man, this guy's really clever. But actually, I think it is in the Bible. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds and teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ until we all attain to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children, tossed to and fro by the waves and carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceit schemes. That doesn't sound so cool. But I love that thing. There's a maturity. He's bringing us to a place of maturity. And to mature, we have to grow and we have to change. If we're staying the same, we're missing out. And there is so much to being a part of this kingdom then I think that we will ever realise. But if we're only capturing a part of it now, we're missing so much more. There's such a depth to this thing. There are so many layers, it's incredible. So when I speak this morning, like we're triune beings, right? We're three parts, body, mind and spirit. So you can receive me just in my body, like my body language as I talk. So I do this. I have meetings at work sometimes. Sometimes my mind prefers to think about other things, like anything else other than the meeting I'm in. I hope, that, you know, hope no one from yeah, work's watching this. But often I'm leading the meeting, it's even worse. So I, you, like you, your face can be paying full attention, because I'm fully there, I'm you know, nodding, when it looks like I should be nodding, because I'm watching the body language of the person, and if they pause and sort of... And you're like, hmm, yes. Or if they look shocked, you look shocked. Or if they say something and smile, you laugh. I'm not paying any attention to what they're saying, but their body language 
you know, you can read it. You don't have to pay attention to the actual content. That's a little tip for all you kids in class. <laughs> uh, so you can receive someone just purely on that level, right? Just purely visually. This is, this is what's going on. The next one, we can engage with someone's mind mentally. And we go, I'm not sure if you've ever listened to a motivational speaker or you've, you've heard someone online or you've been to a meeting and heard someone talk. There's this dude, Zig Ziglar, from ages ago. It's the best name. It's a, it's a legit name. Yeah, Zig Ziglar. And he is fantastic. He's a Christian dude. He's, he's gone to be with the Lord now. But he speaks on this level, and it's just fantastic. Like it, gets, it captivates your mind, the content he shares. So you can hear me this morning and think, oh, yeah, that's kind of interesting what Scott's saying, or, man, this guy's boring, or... <laughs> so you can engage on those two levels, but there's a third level, and this is the level that I want to try and talk a little bit about today. That's the spiritual level. There's another level. And what's happening in the spirit, I don't really know. I'm up here. And I'm hoping my father will be doing some cool stuff. But for you, if you engage with what the Spirit is saying, it might be through me. It might have nothing to do with what I'm saying. I might say a little verse and it reminds you of something else. And your mind just travels off to that thing and you just feel a peace with the Lord and feel something happen and stimulating inside you. Go with it. Because that's what the Lord's doing. We don't want to be forced to listen to someone talk about whatever he's talking about. There's another whole level of this whole Christian experience that I think we, we overlook too easily and miss out. So when, when other people are speaking, or when they're singing, whatever's going on, you don't have to engage just at that surface level. Dig deeper, Lord, what's going on? What are you saying in this moment? Because that's going to be way better than anything that comes out of anyone's mouth. And I say this with all honesty, I've been... Look, I got saved in 1978. I still remember it really clearly. That's a long time ago. Look, I think a couple of you weren't even born here. <laughs> then. I remember that day so clearly. I have been in church my whole life, and I've seen speakers from all around the world, some really good ones. And Steve is an outstanding communicator. The way he speaks and delivers the way he crafts his message, it's really special. So we're, we're really blessed that we can come here on a Sunday morning and hear some, what I'd call someone world class. So he's fantastic. He's a, so he's an amazing speaker. But if you receive him at that level, yeah, that's cool. If you receive him at a deeper level, if you receive what the Lord's saying, that'll change your life. That'll give you a, a more permanent change. Steve's going to share awesome stuff. Um, other people, Renee, we've got some real cool people that speak here. But if we just receive it on that level, we're missing so much more of what is possible. So, yeah, I believe that the Lord is setting us up to take us through a new, uh, to a new place of maturity. We were not tossed to and fro like the waves. And this always gets me. It's so easy, especially in the world we're in at the moment. We get, so, we get bombarded with all this stuff. I don't know if you're on social media. I used to be on Insta. I got off because I'd spend like 30 minutes scrolling through all my friends' stories, seeing what they did for the day. And but I'd, I'm really bad. I'm that person that likes every single thing. Or I put a comment, oh, that's cool. Oh, that looks like fun. Oh, I hope you had a good day. Whatever. Doing those little things. But it's a whole lot of time. But if you get stuck in these things, you can, like, the way that, however they calculate things, they'll send out similar messages and stories. And that's all you're seeing. That becomes your reality. You think the whole world is seeing that because that's what you're seeing but someone next to you doesn't like that thing they're seeing something totally different so their story is totally different I don't know if you're much into the politics thing I'm not really big into it but there's like the left and the right and all this carry on like um, Labour and National that sort of buzz and some people hate National because of whatever capitalist pigs, filthy dogs and then some people hate Labour they're oh, socialists, they don't know anything they're not going to do anything for business, blah, blah, blah. And it gets really extreme. But depending on what you're looking at, that's all things going to be coming through your feed. Either or. And it's just reinforcing. Then you see something else that's slightly different. And like a wave, you just change over to the next one. Because that's cool for that moment. But as Christians, we need a depth. We need a maturity. That happens. Who cares? We're impartial to that. We're not going to get affected, fired up, and, I don't know, offended and angry about these different things because we're at a different level than all of this stuff. That's important, yeah, it's cool, but that 
That stuff is not where we need to dwell and get caught up with our minds. We need to be going deeper. Really kind of not saying what I'm supposed to be saying that I wrote down. (laughs) Segways, yeah, chasing bunny rabbits down holes. So one thing, like when we pray, sometimes we can get caught up. Every time we pray, it's like, oh, Lord, I just my job sucks. I really need a better job. Lord, please make my boss better. Lord, I don't like my school. I want to go to a new school. Lord, Dad is such an egg. <laughs> Please change us. And it's all oh, me, me, me. Help me, help me, help me. And we need to change that focus. Start finding out what he's saying and pray into that. Like the whole thing, your kingdom come. Start, start prayers by telling God how awesome he is. Because it changes our mentality and our focus. And another awesome thing to do in life, and I was blessed for whatever reason to get this revelation when I was young, is be grateful. If you be grateful about things, it will change your whole perception. Similar to what I was saying, like the Insta, Facebook stories, if your lens is gratitude with everything, it changes the way you view life. But if you meet me and hang out with me, I'd like to say, and people say, I'm pretty positive. I don't really get down. And I've had some stink stuff happen, especially in the last few years. I've lost my, who I call my brothers, two of my best mates, passed away. And it sucks, and it's heartbreaking. But that happens, it's a part of life. I'm not gonna, my life is not going to be like turned upside down and dictated by that. Kitty and I had a business, and in the global financial crisis, like ages ago, before the earthquakes, that's a good reference point for people, we lost all of that. We're still paying money at the moment because we didn't want to go bankrupt. So we borrowed money, so we're paying. And that's, that's a long time, that's 15 years, 14 years. So, and some people get really down about that. I'm like, eh, it's just stuff, you know? Carry on. Is it? Because I look at things, and I'm grateful. One little trick, I'll tell you this. My dad, so I used to be hypercritical, like not great, grateful or anything at all. And we were at this church in Auckland, and the music director dude wrote this play, and it was a Christmas play. So they're doing their Christmas thing, and it was mildly entertaining, the songs were all right. The acting was, you know, Kiwi average. And I sat there, and I let my dad know each point how poor this whole performance was and what they could have done better. And my dad, he, I love my dad. He's awesome. He's an ex-cop. And he would put up with stuff with me for a while, and then it was just enough. So he sat there. I don't know how he lasted that long, because my son's here. I don't think I'd be that patient with him for that long. And he said, that's enough. The next word out of your mouth is going to be something positive, followed by another thing positive, by another, and then you can criticise, okay? And I'm like, but... He goes, no. And so it stopped me in my tracks, because I'm like, I don't want to be a negative dude. And then, so I had to think about, try and find three positive things from what was going on. And then I realised I couldn't do that. I couldn't write a play. I was 14 at the time, I think. I thought I was a great musician. <laughs> I was pretty average. Like if 14-year-old me was watching 14-year-old me on stage, he would have a huge list of critiques. <laughs> but what it did for me is from that point on as a teenager, I would look at things, find three positive things to find about something that I'd normally criticise before I'd critique. What happens after a while? You stop looking for the critique. And I just always constantly look for good. I look for good in people. I meet someone... And people say, you know, every time you meet someone new, it's an opportunity to find a new friend. That's the way I look at people. I'm like, how exciting are you, a new friend? What can I find out about them? And I ask questions because I want to know. I want to know more and more and more about them. So, this is, man, no one's asleep yet. (laughs) Something must be going all right. So we need to speak to each other, look at each other with a different lens, totally different lens. A mature lens, not a lens of what can I get out of the situation, but what is happening in the situation, what is God doing in the situation, what is happening for this other person. Instead of me, 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 I need, what does this other person need? It's really easy to say, it's not so easy to do. So I've got some scriptures now, because that's what you do when you preach. First one, Scott, if we could have that one on screen. This is Genesis 1 verse 2. We'll put it up there, I know you all know this, because you're Christians, you read the Bible, Memorise that, especially the start of it, because, you know, it's the start of the book. Everyone knows the beginning part. 
Yeah, look at those looks. I'm feeling a seed of doubt in my heart that you have all memorised the word. Well, we're going to put these up. So this, now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. So we see in the beginning, the Spirit of God was hovering over the water. It was resting, it was being present and whole, like God's Spirit. And I think about it, I love going to the beach. I love it on a stormy, cloudy day. There's something about it, it's moody, and there's, I don't know, there's layers to it. That's, that's, when it's sunny, it's cool too, but you're hoping you might see some lightning or hear a thunder roll or something. It is just something that's, I don't know, way bigger than we are. But imagine seeing God's spirit hovering over the waters. What would that look like? How crazy amazing would that be to experience that moment? Because I don't think we could even possibly comprehend or see what that would be. So, I mean, God's spirit is another level from anything we can comprehend. This is the beginning. God's spirit's out there hovering around. Um, throughout the Old Testament, we don't hear a huge amount about God's Spirit. It would come down and rest on people like uh, David. I wrote some names down so I'd sound real clever. Samson, Old Testament prophets. Hands up, anyone who can name all the Old Testament prophets? All of, Dan can. <laughs> Dan's, oh, you've also nearly memorized the Bible, eh? Almost. Almost, yeah. If we're rounding up. Just about there. Yeah. So we don't hear a huge amount about God's Spirit. We hear it's hovering, it's there, and then it comes on people at different times. And then we get to the New Testament and things start to change a lot more. So Matthew three sixteen, this is another one. Oh look at that. I hardly even said it. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he went up out of the water. At that moment heaven was opened. And he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting on him. So this is John saying about Jesus. So now here's the Spirit back again. Guess who's back? Back. I think that's where Eminem got the inspiration, actually. So <laughs> descending like a dove on him. So Jesus walks around. We don't hear about the Spirit leaving. The Spirit comes on. Jesus does all this wicked cool stuff that we know about, we read about. And... Then it comes to the end, and he goes up to heaven, and we assume, because we don't hear anything else about the Spirit being left behind, the Spirit goes up. So we've had the Spirit down, hovering over the waters, right? And then up, and we hear little like spots of this thing happening. And then up, and then down on Jesus, and then up. And then we get to Acts 2, 1, 3. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. So now we're talking again about the Spirit. So it's gone up, down, up, down. What's that song? Up, down, up, down. Everybody put your hands up and they stay there. Eddie, come on, what's that? Well, you said it's not a good song. And I thought, you obviously know that song. Okay, well, that's all the only part I know of that song anyway. So, you know, now it's come back down. The Spirit is back down, and it's specifically on a group of people. And beforehand, we've had like these moments, but nothing like this. Nothing on a group of people. But it's the same Spirit, His Spirit, spread amongst different people. Like, we can experience the Holy Spirit as Christians differently. I don't know if you've ever felt like that, that cool wind is a cool wind of the Spirit. And sometimes you just be praying or music or someone speak. There's something happens and you just feel like this breeze. And there's no breeze. There's no doors are open. There's nothing going on. And you just feel, and it's like a refreshing thing. And that's real cool. Sometimes you feel like that fire inside and it's really powerful. And you're like, it feels like there's a furnace in here right now. But there's no furnace. But you can feel and sense something. Sometimes you get that tingling. I don't know if you get that tingling thing. Like, it's hard to explain, but it's like an internal tingling, an excitement or a buzz. There's no reason other than what's happening externally at that moment. We get to experience the Holy Spirit in these different ways. And what I like about this thing with the Holy Spirit coming on these people 
is that's what's happened to us. When we invite the Lord into our heart, we invite him. His Holy Spirit comes into us. So now we're one of those that is, like, has those tons of fire. What originally was like hovering over the sea of people is now hovering in us, and we are like the sea hovering over this planet. And one thing that I had this revelation, this is where I want to get to with all of this, is that our part in this is we need to look to find our other friends, our other whanau, where the Spirit is, where the Spirit's resting. So there's this cool verse in Psalm 42.7. Last verse, I promise, because I know you guys, you're like, we already know this stuff, Scott. You don't need to keep going on about verses. Deep calls to deep in the roar of your waterfalls. All your waves and breakers have swept over me. I love that deep calls to deep. His spirit inside us is a deep and wondrous thing. That same spirit that hovered before creation, that same deep, powerful, whole spirit that hung around then is inside us. Deep calls out to deep. We need to look and see that in each other. Often, and this, I do it still, and it really annoys me. I still judge people for different reasons and to have this reaction. And it's just, man, like, I want to say these words I'm not allowed to say because people tell me off. Because, yeah, they're not appropriate or whatever. But how can I explain it without using some of these words? This is really difficult. You're going to get me in trouble, Eddie. Like, you think, how can, how can I, who's been a Christian so long, who knows the Lord so well, think these thoughts about other people? And they're not that bad. Like, when you look on the scale of it, but in my mind, I shouldn't be thinking any of this at all. Because sometimes people annoy me, and I think, you should know better, you know, blah, 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 blah. But who am I to judge? I'm not the one that should be doing any of this judging. What I need to be doing is looking like, when I was that 14-year-old, for the good stuff, looking for his spirit in each other. Now, this, is, this was a really humbling experience. So our whānau, we moved up to Tauranga for a couple of years, and we came back to Christchurch, and we are looking for a place to go to church. And when I looked to go for where we should go to church, or stay at church, I don't go into a place and think, yeah, that feels cool, I'm going to go here. I say, God, where do you want me to go? Because I want to be sent. I want God to say, my son, this is where you go. Uh, Because if you're going because it's a a feel-good buzz, when that feel-good buzz changes, what do you got then? I had to stay at a church for about five years longer than I wanted to, and that was a real test on my attitude, because I did not want to be there, and I let my wife know about it, and she wanted to be there, and that wasn't a good way of communicating in a relationship. Just heads up. For all you guys, if you say something that's really annoying your wife and you pick up on it, stop. (laughs) If you're going to keep doing that for four years, you're going to have some bad work stories afterwards. Anyway, so we're looking for a church to go to. We went to a few and little judgy Scott comes out because I'm going to be like, what on earth is this? Like, do they even know God? Like, this isn't that long. I mean, this is maybe eight, nine years ago. And then I said to Katie, like, babe, I'm going to this Catholic church that's on in this road, a Lady Fatima. And Kitty, my beautiful wife, didn't want me to go to that church because she thought that I was going to that church with the intention of that becoming our new home church. But I just thought, oh, I'm just going to go check out a Catholic church. Because if you asked me before I went to this church what I thought of Catholics, I would tell you it's about every stink thing you could think that you hear in the news, you know, they make jokes about the ministers and I won't use that P word because there's kids here, but doing nasty stuff to kids because it gets, as soon as one does it, it gets chucked all over the media. We hear about this mighty church and they're evil and they've got all this money and they're not doing any good and blah, 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 blah. So I turn up at this place, open to what God might be doing, but still pretty judgy, thinking, you know, they've got all this waste of time with... Um, you know, little swingy things with incense and that. They didn't have that at this one. But I turned up, and what I didn't expect was the presence of God and the Holy Spirit there. And I sat there like the biggest dumb 
backside you've ever seen. Like, how have I judged these people for all this time when I'm judging the Spirit of God and all these people by doing that? It was a massively humbling experience for me. It brought me back to earth really powerfully because I'm like, what am I doing? What, what, who do I think I am? These beautiful people. And this, at the end, I sat there, I was crying. I'm like, Lord, I am sorry for being such a dick about this. I'm crying, and this lady came up, this maturely aged lady. She had a lot of experience on the planet. And... You shouldn't laugh at that sort of thing. So she puts a hand on me, and she prayed this nice little prayer, and I was already crying, and it just broke me, because the sweetness... And this lady, that I, if you asked me before, I probably would have judged her. Well, no, she's a Catholic. Well, she doesn't know God. What does she know about life? It's just total rubbish. So all we need to do as Christians is be really aware of this stuff. We need to look, instead of looking for the things for superiority, where I'm a better Christian because I know this scripture and I've read this or whatever, we need to look for commonality. Start looking for other people. I love that we pray for other churches this morning. This is the best. We celebrate... Like Dylan said, we're all on a, the same journey ultimately, but we might be at different parts. And just because you're further down doesn't mean you're better, because you might get shunted back soon. Who cares? All I care about now more and more is knowing more people who love our Father, bringing more people into that experience to see what that's like. It says that creation groans and cries out for the sons and daughters to be revealed. We need to be revealed on this planet, not as judgy people. Like if you read the, the New Testament, it's fascinating, the scriptures. Jesus came hardcore against the people of the age, the teachers, the, what I would call the Christians of the age. Because they were the ones doing all the judging and setting the examples that were all full of themselves and rubbish. We need to get past that, man. We need to start looking for commonality looking for strength, looking for Christ in each other. There's a cool thing with um, Mary and Elizabeth. So when they're both pregnant, and Elizabeth chilling out, she's pregnant with John, and then Mary comes in with baby Jesus, well, not baby Jesus yet because he's in the womb. I don't know how that... What would you call that? Fetus Jesus, yeah. <laughs> FJ. And so when... Baby, G baby fetus Jesus comes into the room and this is getting bad. Get ready to mute this, Sean. This is going crazy. So when that comes in, Elizabeth feels this leaping in her womb. Her spirit is, there's something that's going on because something else is happening. We need to be aware of that. Start looking for commonalities. Start looking for where are these moments that we can Join together. Instead of looking for differences, look for what we have in common. I mean, it's my biggest, my biggest cry is we just, our levels of maturity, we get deeper and deeper into what God's doing. This isn't a surface buzz. This is where we're at. There's so many layers. There are so many depths. There are so many more levels to this whole Christian experience than what we're probably on right now, most of us. And we get busy, and this stuff goes on. Yeah, I know that. That's cool. But constantly seek more. Constantly ask the Lord, what are you doing? What do you want me to pray for? It's not a hard question, but we keep looking past it. What do you want me to pray for for Mike? What is Mike doing, Lord, that I could be helpful? Take the focus off ourselves. Put it onto God. What's God doing? These sorts of things... I think we, we miss a lot. That deep calls to deep. Let the deep inside us call out. We don't have to comprehend and understand it up here. This is the dumbest part of our bodies, you know, our mind. This is, honestly, it's the most retarded part of a human. Because this blocks the Holy Spirit. It blocks what's going on constantly. And we need to learn, try tune in more to what the Spirit's doing. What is God doing? What are you doing in this place? What is going on right now? How should I respond? Don't, yeah, don't get hung up on wanting to be better than other people because we know more. Or we've had a different experience and our experience is the valid experience because they don't actually, they haven't been through it as tough as we went through it. Like pregnancy. That was hard for me.
Love you, Eddie. Look for commonalities. Look for what God's doing. Look for what God's doing in other people's lives. Pray about it. Maybe God will say, speak to them about it. Give them a word. We're going to have communion now. This again is another coming together moment. It's something bigger than ourselves. There's a lot more depth to what's going on, I think, in this moment than we appreciate. Let your heart be open to it. Thanks, Scott. That's great. I think that uh, it's a great, great encouragement to uh, train our spirit to turn into the Spirit of God. Uh, and that's going to manifest more in how we treat other people probably than any other area. One of the things I really appreciate about Scott is that he, he practices that. He really looks to draw out the best in others. Uh, and we're grateful for the way you love us. We're grateful for the way you love people. We're grateful for how you love people in your workplace. It's uh, It's amazing. We're going to take communion together. We're going to come around the table. uh, As we just continue to allow the Spirit of God to speak to our hearts, and it's an opportunity for us to respond together. We're going to do it a little bit differently than what we've been doing. Uh, I I love uh, one of the the pictures of humanity and God in the Bible, in the Old Testament that I love uh, the most, maybe, uh, is in the creation story. And we see here this God who makes humanity to enjoy walking together, relationship, connection. Uh, He wants it to be love. He wants it to be genuine, not forced. So he gives the ability to choose. And at the essence of that choice, when you see the serpent come in and tempt Adam and Eve, the essence of that choice was, will you let me be God? Or will you choose to be your own God and determine for yourself what's right, what's wrong? We know the story. Adam and Eve chose the sin, uh, rejected God's ways, ruptured firstly relationship with the Father, then ruptured relationship with each other. And there's an interesting thing that happens. We see firstly they go off and they hide themselves. They cover themselves. uh, And then God comes looking where are you? Uh, what's happened? And what do they do then? They blame each other. Oh, it was her fault. Oh, it was his fault. It was serpent's fault. <laughs> and so you see this pattern of our humanity, what sin does to us, it distorts us. And that firstly, you see self-righteousness. Oh, I, need to, I need to hide the, the bad bits of me. I need to cover that with my own effort, my own achievements and then we see self-justification well we ended up doing it because that person said this and this person said that I wonder have you ever wondered what would have happened what would have gone on from there if they had just owned up and said we did it we did wrong we rejected you we're so sorry but they didn't they sought to cover they sought to justify themselves well you know it's not that big a deal of a sin of course none of us do that today right we fail to recognize that all sin is a rejection of God being God it's a rejection of his ways it's a rejection of relationship it's a rejection of the right order of things and then Jesus came in the fullness of time as the promise was given in the garden to the serpent well the offspring of this woman it's going to crush your head you'll strike his heel prophetic picture about how God himself was going to make a way for the issue of sin and rejection to be made right to be put right to be redeemed to be restored one of the other things I love so much about that picture is you do not see there or anywhere else in the Bible the disposition of God coming to say, well, yeah, you've ticked me off. It's over. You see right there and all the way through the Bible, Old Testament and New Testament, a God coming to seek, to put right. Where are you? Not because he didn't know. 
He was hoping they would recognize that that's separated, rejected, come back. All of us need Jesus to save us and Jesus to be God again. We talked today, you know, Scott's talking about how we view other people, central to the gospel, central to our selfish nature, seeking to justify ourselves by somebody else, put someone else down, not operating in love. We all need forgiveness. This constant, continual journey with God of allowing Him to expose the areas of our lives where we reject Him still. To come back and say, God, I'm not going to cover up. I'm not going to make excuse. I'm sorry. Do in me what you need to do. Change in me what you need to change. Forgive me. You know what happens? After all that's been said and done, the final part of the story at the garden, the Bible says, and God clothed them with animal skin. He did for them what they needed and had tried to do for themselves. It's just a little snippet, one aspect of what communion is for me. We've got the tables up the front this morning. In a moment, I'm going to ask you to sit there and weigh up your heart with God and invite Him. Say, Jesus, where am I holding you out? Where am I resisting your ways? I'm going to come to the table of forgiveness this morning. I want you to come and grab one of these. In the top, there's a little the piece of bread. You've got to just peel that first layer first. A little bit tricky just explaining that for, uh, for the noobs here. There's gluten-free uh, crisps on this side. Um, take time. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you've done for me. You come to me. You've made a way for me. Forgive me. Drink the juice, which is symbolic of his blood. Say, Jesus, I thank you that you clothe me in forgiveness and righteousness. And uh, normally we hand them out when you come in. And we didn't want to do that today because uh, that's cool. But, you know, I just, I just... The older I get in this faith journey, the more frustrated I get with us approaching our faith. Like, do something for me. Would you do something for me? <laughs> Someone else. You know, it's like, hey, we've got to devote ourselves. So today, it's like, oh, I'd be cool to actually do want to partake in communion. And anybody is welcome. In this church, everybody is welcome as long as you understand that this is coming to union with Jesus. Come and take it this morning. Take it back to the step out of your seats as a Jesus son. You're, you're looking for me. I'm responding to you. Let me pray. And the team are going to sing an incredible song. Come to the altar. Jesus, I want to thank you for what you've been speaking to us, been depositing in our spirits. And as we create this space around communion, we're asking that you'd continue to speak to us by your spirit. We're asking that you would continue to meet with us, reveal truth to us, forgive us, remind us of your grace, remind us of the forgiveness of the cross, remind us of your great love demonstrated at the cross. May we enter into it afresh this morning. Change us, God. Continue to wipe away the residue of sin in the past in our lives that we may be who you've created us to be, holy and righteous. Meet with us in this place around your table. Again, we say thank you for the cross. Thank you for your body that was broken. Thank you for your blood that was given. That we may come back to you. That as we walk with you, you are making all things new again. All things are being made right. Right.